Hello and welcome to Encore, the arts and culture show here on France Lane Cat. Today we're talking movies, top of the bill. Who says the perfect woman needs a body? We take a look at Spike Jonze's futuristic love story, Her. Plus the women behind the camera, as an all-female film festival takes place here in France, we ask if these types of events are still relevant. And want to know what Paris looked like in the 60s? Veteran writer-director Agnes Varda's classic film, Cleo, from 5 to 7, is being re-released, taking you on a real-time trip through the French capital. All that and more coming up, so let's go get started. And I'm joined for our film show, as always, by our film critic, Lisa Nesselson. Great to have you with us, Lisa. Hello, Jade. We're going to start with the big release here in France of the week, the Spike Jonze's film, Her. Now, the title suggests that it's about a woman, but that's not actually the case, is it? Uh, not really. It's set in the near future, and it's about a man who falls in love with, well, Hold on, we'll get to that. Joaquin Phoenix plays Theodore, who earns his living writing letters for people who don't have the time or the talent to write their own intimate correspondence. And he's a decent, sensitive fellow, still very, very sad about the breakup of his marriage when he buys a new computer operating system. Now, this is no ordinary piece of software. It's a very accommodating personal assistant named Samantha who learns to anticipate Theodore's every need, and it speaks to him with the voice of Scarlett Johansson. So given how funny and thoughtful she is, it's not hard for us to believe it when Theodore falls heads, Theodore falls heads over heels in love with Samantha, who is the perfect woman, except that she's the voice of a computer and has no earthly body, but is a body really a prerequisite for a romance? Let's watch. Mr. Theodore Twombly, welcome to the world's first artificially intelligent operating system. How would you describe your relationship with your mother? Thank you. Please wait as your operating system is initiated. Hello, I'm here. Hi. Hi, I'm Samantha. Good morning, Theodore. Good morning. You have a meeting in five minutes. You want to try getting out of bed? Hey, you're too funny. Okay, good, I'm funny. I've never loved anyone the way I love you. Me too. Now we know how. Lisa, it looks super interesting, but I'm still a little bit dubious. I'm really not a sci-fi fan. Is that what this film is? Technically, yes, but I don't think you have to be put off by it because the world is now full of people who grow anxious if they can't check their social media platforms several times an hour, right? Some people break into a cold sweat and actually show the same withdrawal symptoms as someone who's addicted to heroin or alcohol if you take away their smartphone. I have to admit, I may be one of those people. <laughs> Sorry to hear that. If millions of people in 2014 have that kind of codependent relationship with their telephone, Falling in love with a voice in a computer doesn't really seem all that far-fetched. Now, speaking for myself, I happen to be a member of the last analog generation. So my attention span and my tastes and sensibilities were formed by things like memorization, looking things up in actual physical books, taking physical notes. But digital natives, the people who came after, see the world differently. And even though humanity did fine for thousands and thousands of years without cell phones or, or computers, we're now convinced that we can't get along without them, which sounds an awful lot like love to me. In love with technology. All right, well, director Spike Jones won an Oscar for this screenplay. It sounds like it's a must-see then. Um, I like it quite a bit. Some of my colleagues have reservations because they don't understand why Theodore falls in love with his computer operating system when there are flesh and blood women running around, including one played by Amy Adams. Johansson gives Samantha a, a really attractive, genuine wonderfulness with just her voice and inflection. And as a sidebar, uh, the role was originally voiced by the British actress uh, Samantha Morton. For whatever reason, they decided to go with something more rot gut American. And I think in the end, they made the right choice because Johansson's terrific. Who wouldn't fall in love with the sexy, sultry <laughs> tones of Scarlett Johansson? All right, well, from future the futuristic to relics from the past. Lisa, I think you might like this one. There's currently an exhibition showcasing movie posters from the 60s and 70s in the French city of Toulouse. The larger-than-life pictures were designed to be displayed on the marquees of movie houses and were all hand-painted by one man, artist André Azai. Catherine Viette checks it out. They're a snapshot of 60s and 70s cinema. All hand-painted and measuring between 5 metres wide and 2 metres tall, they're enormous. 
Most of these posters were made to be displayed on the facade of the Royale, a movie theater in downtown Toulouse that's been gone for decades. The whole idea was to present the posters as they were back then on the streets above movie theaters. What's interesting is that the posters you see here for the same film were not the exact same in other towns. That's because each creation was totally original. The movie posters were all painted and designed by artist Andrea Zai. During his heyday, he could produce on average six posters a week for several different theaters. They could be customized, like this one for Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey. He uses part of the spaceship on the poster, for example, and then on the press kit, he pulled out the astronaut's face, which he enlarged on the poster, so it's really his vision of the film. So what's interesting when you see this exhibit and these posters is that it's also the artist's view of the films. A view that tells the story of films made in the 60s and 70s. If you look carefully at the composition of these posters, the characters play a central role. Another important component is the lettering. That's art in itself. Made to lure moviegoers into the latest blockbuster, these posters have now become works of art in their own right. Lisa, as the saying goes, they don't make them like they used to, do they? Is this a bit of a lost art? I'm afraid it is because I can't believe he was that prolific in that format. And we've tipped over into photography for most uh, posters. So I think it is a bit of a lost art, painting one image to represent a film. It's a bit of a shame, isn't it? Well, from giants of the movie industry, so to speak, to some that are somewhat more sidelined, the 36th Crete International Women's Film Festival is underway on the outskirts of Paris. Lisa, some people might be a bit surprised to hear that such an event like this even exists in this day and age? Well, it's not the only one uh, do devoted to, to just women's work, but uh, it's probably the biggest one on earth. And women come from all over Europe, indeed all over the world, to participate. When I was, this gets me thinking, when I was in film school in the mid-1970s, a male professor of mine did not get in trouble for declaring, I quote, women can't make movies, end quote. I assumed that a teacher would get castrated or perhaps uh, circumcised so. without anesthesia <laughs> if he dared to say <laughs> such a thing out loud nowadays. So I've witnessed enormous progress since I graduated. And do you think there's been progress everywhere, though? I like to think so, but you know, there was there was just a survey released in the U.S. that says there's a dire shortage of women both in front of and behind the camera. But here in France, they say half of the students enrolled in film schools happen to be women, and uh, more women are directing all the time. When I was voting for year-end awards, I took a really close look at the lists of films that were released here in France in 2013, and here's what I found out. Some statistics out of approximately 260 French films last year, a total of 69 were directed by women. And uh, of those, 28 were first-time directors, so that bodes very well. I count an additional 52 movies directed from women by women from other countries. So that's a list that includes Catherine Bigelow, Sarah Polly, po Sally Potter, Margarita von Troda, and Lena Wertmuller. So if you ignore the actual dates on which these movies happen to come out, filmgoers in France had their choice of 2.43 new films directed by a woman every week of the year. So I prefer the thing that the screen is not half empty, but half full. Impressive stats there, but do you think then this type of event still has its place? Absolutely. I think that, that the work of women uh, in whatever field will always be a valid theme to build an event on. And this one is great for networking, for taking stock of whether there's such a thing as a feminine gaze, whether women approach different topics than men might, and do they approach them differently. And that professor of mine who said women can't make movies, he was very, very wrong. He most certainly was. All right, well, let's take a look at one of the nine films that were shown at the festival. Homo Stratus is an experimental piece from Vietnamese director Sao Pham. It's a surreal meditation on contemporary temporary life. Let's take a look.
All right, Lisa, we're well, speaking of women filmmakers. A classic is being re-released in French cinemas, isn't it? Yes, and I'm so glad. Anya Svarda, still going strong in her 80s, is sometimes called the godmother of the French New Wave. She started out as a photographer, and nobody was going to tell her that she could not make movies, and she's made quite a few. But her magnificent 1961 film, Cleo from 5 to 7, remains an innovative treat half a century after it was made mostly in the streets of Paris. It's a lovely look back at how the Paris was in the 60s, isn't it? The title might not have this connotation for some of our English-speaking audience, but here in France, Saint Asset from 5 to 7 implies a sensual interlude in the afternoon, doesn't it? Is that what this film is about? Uh, well, she does have a date, but it's possibly with death himself. I say that because the film unfolds in real time as Cleo, who's a successful singer, waits for the results of a medical test as to whether or not she has cancer. She's beautiful, seems very much alive, but time speeds up and slows down for her over the course of this 90-minute film as she awaits the results. So, things to look out for when you go. Uh, that's French composer Michel Legrand playing a musician who stops by Cleo's fabulous loft, and the new wave director Jean-Luc Godard and his muse Anna Karina act an adorable little mock silent film within the film. And there's a political subtext too because uh, Cleo is worried that she may be, will enough, uh, may be ill enough to die and she meets a soldier on leave from the Algerian conflict and of course his life is also at risk but in combat. It's a film I never tire of. See it if you can. All right, well definitely one for you to check out. We're going to leave you now with a clip of the film. Thank you though as always to our film critic Lisa Nesselson for your wonderful cinematic insights. Thanks to you also for tuning in. Don't forget you can get more culture news on our social networks. Enjoy and see you again soon. Cette figure de poupée est toujours la même. Et ça pour ridicule. Je ne peux même pas lire ma propre peur. Depuis toujours, je pense que tout le monde me regarde et moi je ne regarde personne que moi. C'est la sang. Ne vous attendrissez pas sur les grenouilles. Elles ne souffrent pas. Nous reverrons le jour vivante dans un moment. Venez, petite grenouille, on va vous changer l'aquarium. Troisième grenouillard.